Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. As promised, I wanted to go over my polar exploration uh, nonfiction collection. But before I get into that, maybe I'll talk about why I find polar exploration to be worth reading about at all. Well, for one thing, there's the survival element. Uh, polar exploration is usually involving some level of peril and um, survival tactics perseverance, and a general faith in each other and in God to get you out of the situation. Uh, it's quite clear by this point that certainly in the Antarctic, there's not really any particular uh, motive for exploration in the sense of whether we might be able to colonize there. Uh, the South Pole is pretty much, I mean, it's basically a desert and the only people living there right now are mostly scientists and the people supporting them. Uh, so there's something appealing to me about journeys to these places where there's not necessarily an external motive. It's, it's almost for the sake of it, and I just find that to be very interesting. Um, the first book I'm going to be talking about is dealing with the Arctic, so maybe we'll just look at this real quick. This is good old uh, magazine clipping here. This is just a little info chart about the Arctic from this magazine that my dad gave me a couple years ago. Um, but as, it, as you can see, it covers quite a few countries in this Arctic circle here. Um, most of it is actually islands. Um, so you've got uh, the New Siberian Islands. You've got Greenland, very famously. Uh, Franz Josef Land, which we'll talk about in a minute here and on an, numerous other islands and so forth. As far as how many people live there, um, according to this infographic, uh, there were in 2018 4 million people living there. Temperature ranges from 0 to 40 degrees Celsius. Um, polar bears live there, uh, various indigenous groups and nations. So I, I really like this infographic and it kind of uh, gives you an idea of the landscape for this book, uh, this first one called In the Land of White Death by Valerian Albanov, an epic story of survival in the Siberian Arctic. I picked this book up, I don't remember where I first heard about it. I got this at Powell's Bookstore in Portland, Oregon, which is a super fun place to go if you're in the neighborhood. Um, so who was this Valerian Albanov? He was born in the 1880s in Russia, and he was the navigator of this ship called the St. Anna. In 1912, six months after Robert Falcon Scott and four of his men came to grief in Antarctica, a 32-year-old Russian navigator named Albanov embarked on an expedition that would prove even more disastrous. In search of new Arctic hunting grounds, his ship, the St. Anna, was frozen fast in the pack ice of the treacherous Kara Sea, a misfortune grievously compounded by an incompetent commander, the absence of crucial nautical charts, insufficient fuel, and inadequate provisions that left the crew weak and debilitated by scurvy. So uh, there were 25 men and one woman on this ship, and after a year and a half, they had to make a choice whether they were going to stay there in the ice pack or uh, try to get away. So. Albanov and 13 crewmen left the ship in January 1914, hauling makeshift sledges and kayaks behind them across the frozen sea, hoping to reach the distant coast of Franz Josef Land. Let me see if I can pull that up here, quite literally. Um, so, it's right there. Yeah, I don't... I mean, this isn't necessarily the complete map, but gets, gives you a general idea of where they were. Uh, with only a shockingly inaccurate map to guide him, Albanov led his men on a 235-mile journey of continuous peril, enduring blizzards, disintegrating ice flows, attacks by polar bears and walrus, starvation, sickness, snow blindness, and mutiny. And so this book is the is based on his notes from the time. So it does have a very uh, journalistic quality to it, and I actually really enjoy that. It's not super difficult to read, and I would say if you're going to read one book about 
polar exploration. It should be this book because it's very human. It gives you a general sense of the kind of challenges you face in those kinds of conditions. Um, the kind of challenges the terrain poses, such as the giant crevasses and uh, all that kind of thing. And I really loved, again, the human element in this book because you get a sense of the kinds of conflicts people had with each other as they were trying to decide what to do. And uh, Albanoff also had a very interesting dream in one of these uh, episodes of his days. So that element, the spiritual element, uh, has a role here as well. All in all, just a great little book, very thought-provoking. Sad thing is, uh, he, so it says he continued going to sea until his death in 1919. He did survive this ordeal, but he ended up dying in, I believe it was a terrorist attack. Uh, the train he was on blew up. Tragically, he, though he survived this, he ended up dying an unnatural death, which is really, really sad. Um, but yes, this is In the Land of White Death. And truthfully, that is the only North Pole book I'll be talking about today. Uh, there are others, of course. I just have not read many. Um, the next one I'll be talking about is, well, frankly, it'll be focused very much from here out on Ernest Shackleton and his exploration of the South Pole. <laughs> Another uh, magazine clipping here. Gotta love the fluffy baby penguins. Yeah, one of my goals is to go to Antarctica someday, but it's, uh, it's not a cheap trip. Okay, so what do we need to know about the Antarctic? So if you can see here, it is a continent, unlike the North Pole. So up here you've got, or I should say over here, you've got South America. So that teeny bit of land right there is the southernmost tip of South America. And uh, fun fact, I, I mentioned Magellania by Jules Verne in another video, and it takes place right around here. Uh, so what's pretty typical, I think, in these uh, narratives, these real life narratives, is that they'd first travel down to like south of Georgia here and then from there go to Antarctica. Uh, some famous landmarks here, or now made famous, you've got the Ross Sea. Um, you know, this doesn't show like the bases and stuff, but um, those are there as well. Um, let's look at these facts. So, We've got a much smaller population of one to 4,000 people as of 2018, or whenever these stats were collected. Um, temperature is, a, there's some overlap, so 28, negative 28 to negative 60 degrees Celsius, but as you can see, it does get colder than the North Pole, quite a bit colder. Uh, 20 million breeding penguins six intact historic explorers huts and 98 percent of the continent is covered in ice so yeah some pretty extreme conditions this really started my whole journey down polar exploration uh i don't think i'm going to start with that particular book which was south i'm going to start with the heart of the antarctic the Farthest South Expedition, 1907 to 1909. Uh, so Ernest Shackleton uh, first went down to the South Pole with uh, Robert Scott. And Robert Scott was another explorer whom Ernest didn't really get along with, but we'll get into that a bit later. So after Shackleton came back, he decided to go on his own expedition, and this was in 1907. Uh, this one was focused on trying to reach that South Pole. And the ship in this voyage was called the Nimrod. The party encountered obstacles from the start as the overloaded Nimrod was tossed in the icy, turbulent waters. But Shackleton and his men succeeded in ascending. 
the 13,000-foot volcanic Mount Erebus, reaching the magnetic South Pole and penetrating deeper into the continent than anyone had before. Um, they defied death every step of the way, traversing crevasse-riddled glaciers, facing constant exhaustion from short rations, combating snow blindness, sub-zero temperatures, and sudden blizzards, and hauling hundreds of pounds of supplies over the frozen wasteland after the death of their Manchurian ponies. Then, only 97 miles from achieving the dream, Shackleton and his party had to abandon their quest and execute a desperate forced march to reach the Nimrod before its departure date, or face being marooned on the ice. Overall thoughts on this book, uh, I read this one second after South. Um, South being his more famous memoir of his second trip. I should say second trip as commander. Um, this book is more readable, a little more human, I would say. Uh, by human, I mean just talking about human elements and things that you and I are more likely to be interested in. I think my biggest takeaway from this is you shouldn't bring horses down to the South Pole. It just doesn't work. Uh, yeah, my copy is falling apart here. It does have some pictures. <laughs> they even... Okay, I remember now. In this book, they also tried to use a car. I mean, keep in mind that this was all very exploratory, not just in the sense of going to a new place, but also you know, the technology involved. So they had some uh, failures as well as successes, but the, the ponies definitely didn't work out. I don't remember if the car w worked out. I don't think it did. Basically, there's a reason he didn't bring cars and ponies on his next trip. At least I don't think he brought a car. He definitely didn't bring ponies. So yeah. I would say this is highly readable. Um, again, it's not going to be a huge page turner. I mean, he does go into the whole process in detail and, and, and Shackleton is not one to get super emotional or dramatic in his writing, at least not in these books. Um, so just keep that in mind, uh, but it certainly holds a lot of interest. Um, as a example of exploration, but also of technology. So yeah, South, let's talk about that. Um, I already have shown this little excerpt book before. The full memoir is called South, and this one is his more famous expedition, the last Antarctic expedition of Shackleton and the Endurance, and this is the this is the endurance. So I'm just going to read off a little bit of my book review that I wrote back in 2012 because it was one of my favorite book reviews, book reviews to write and the points I mentioned in it still hold true. So, Autumn 1914. The Great War is being fought, yet as Sir Ernest Shackleton's volunteering of his expedition and resources is politely refused by the British government, he has embarked upon his planned expedition, south. He has two ships, the Endurance and the Aurora. Beginning on the Ross Sea coast, I'll show you that again, just for context, right there. So beginning on the Ross Sea coast, the group from the Aurora is to set up depots with supplies at key points on the Antarctic continent. From the Weddell Sea, which I do not honestly see on here, I believe this is the Weddell Sea. Got another map here I can reference, yes. So the Aurora ship was going to be down here. They're going to have people um, putting out depots with supplies, and then Shackleton was going to come from the other direction, Weddell Sea, and they were going to try to make the crossing this direction. So the problem they run into is um, the weather and the ice is like super bad, so they're not able to get to where they need to be, and the ship actually gets stuck. So 
Not only are they stuck and they don't have any radio signals, they don't know what's going on with the aurora down here. They don't even know uh, what's going on with the war. So it's pretty dramatic the way this starts out. Um, and really it becomes a matter of survival because eventually the endurance sinks and they're just left stranded here. And so they have to figure out a way to get back to uh, a place they can get help, which would probably be South Georgia. Um, yeah, it's actually one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. Um, there are some human components in it as far as how did they spend their time. They actually played some soccer games on the ice. Um, it talks about how they prepared food on their portable stove. Um, things they did to entertain themselves, like reading the cookbook. Um, just those kind of things that you hope you never have to deal with, but it's just interesting to see how they did. And then, of course, there's the whole narrative of how how do they go get help and who stays behind and all that stuff. One thing that I absolutely love, too, is the photographer took tons of beautiful pictures of everything that was happening. I mean, imagine being in a fight for survival and you're still taking incredible pictures. And we're not talking, you know, iPhones here. This is, uh, this took some real effort to set up and to capture. So that really adds to the book. So if you're going to be reading it, I highly recommend reading it along with the pictures. This edition is Lion's Press. Um, and it's got a nice font size as well, so just a solid copy. So this is the book that really got me started reading about polar exploration. And I think what really strikes me is not only is it an amazing story and in some places truly miraculous, but also it really makes you think hard about why would someone want to do this first of all and what is its relevance to us today, right? Um, as far as why they went down there, I'm just going to read this preface by Sir Ernest. He said, my mind turned to the crossing of the continent, for I was morally certain that either Amundsen or Scott would reach the pole on our own route or a parallel one. After hearing of the Norwegian success, I began to make preparations to start a last great journey, so that the first crossing of the continent should be achieved by a British expedition. So there was an element of nationalism and competition going on here. Uh, it wasn't merely exploration. They wanted to be the first country to do this. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the survival rate was really good in this book, but after they came back, some of the men who had survived also died of unnatural causes during World War I. So it really struck me that, you know, even in the worst conditions, for whatever reason, you know, call it in my opinion, uh, God's providence, they survived and and yet when they came back, they ended up being uh, slaughtered in World War One. So just really good food for thought about, you know, the condition of humankind. And, and also I think that polar exploration is a bit of a metaphor because it's in some ways, it's completely illogical when we know that we're not going to be living down there. At least it's been about 100 years and we're still not living down there like we're living in other places. Um, but there's still a fascination with it and much you can learn. So I just really enjoy those aspects to this topic as well. So my battery is running low here. I'm going to try to uh, get through the last books on a more accelerated level. Uh, Shackleton by Roland Huntford. Found this at the thrift store. I uh, thought it was pretty interesting. It really talks a lot about his relationship with Robert Falcon Scott and the tension that uh, caused the first uh, expedition with him to be a negative experience for Shackleton. 
and uh, that that was certainly worth reading about. As I got further into the book, I felt like the author was really, uh, I, I didn't care for his personal opinions on some of this stuff, so it kind of turned me off, but I do plan to finish this at some point, point. Uh, and I do think it's fairly well written. I didn't take me long to read that, so I don't know if I would necessarily pay full price for this, but it's got some good information for fans. Endurance by Alfred Lansing. Um, this is a book I have not read either. Yeah, this is also supposed to be very good. I can't speak to it personally, but it's certainly a lot shorter than some of the other books, so um, a good option from what I know of it. Um, this book is this book is called Shackleton's Boat Journey by Frank Worsley. Uh, this one I haven't read either, but this is the account written by the captain on the Endurance, okay? So, I believe this also has some pictures. Oh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I haven't read it yet, as I mentioned, but it looks highly readable and much more abbreviated than South. So if you're looking for something on the shorter side, this might be a good option. Um, from what I've read about Frank, he seemed like a really decent person as far as you know, really sticking by Shackleton and just being a great supportive uh, person on the expedition. So um, I'm really interested to hear what his thoughts were. And then finally, another thrift store find. This is a uh, one of those coffee table books called The Endurance by Caroline Alexander. And this is essentially a picture book with text. That's Mrs. Chippy the cat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, ha I actually haven't read the text, but the pictures are really neat. And at some point I'm going to go through and, and read it as well. But again, the photos really uh, document the whole thing in, in such a very... I would say shocking way. I mean, you can really understand how how trapped they were when you see pictures like that. And it's not just the feeling of being trapped though. Like here you can see them playing soccer. So uh, the photographer really tried to to show all sides of the experience. The work, the entertainment, the suffering and the, the joys. Yeah, so this is a great book for the pictures anyway. There's Captain Worsley right there. So I do look forward to looking through that in more depth when I get a chance. Um, that's basically all I had so far. Uh, there are certainly other polar exploration books by the Norwegians, and uh, I think some people in more recent times as well. Um, but I really enjoy the genre. Uh, if you have any recommendations for this genre, please let me know because uh, it's just fascinating to me, and I just enjoy going to a different place in time that is so surreal, honestly. And I'm hoping that someday to be able to go there myself and see it will just kind of bring everything full circle. <laughs> so thanks for watching. I hope you're all staying safe during this time. And um, let me know if you have any other ideas for videos. Thanks for watching.